<laughs> Hello, friends. Uh, Andre Ivanov back here at uh, this wonderful uh, table with the one and only Alison Gorsuch this month's iteration of what's in the box that we just sent you. Uh, this month, we're taking you to Portugal. And not just to Portugal, we're taking you to a very specific part of Portugal, right on the border with Spain. This is one of the most isolated and one of the hottest and one of the most, like, truly crazy places in the world where wine is grown. Uh, we went here in 2014 for the first time, and literally to get to this winery, Joaquim's notes were, uh, turn at big rock, <laughs> right. go uphill, turn at tree. Uh, my uh, friend uh, Jake, at the entire time, was like, dude, like we're absolutely fucking lost. No, we there's a big tree. <laughs> so this is a winery that's located in the same place that uh, brings you port. But uh, port is a sweet fortified wine. This is what happens when you take the same grapes and you make them into a dry red wine. Uh, this winery is located in a national park that's also a bird sanctuary. Like right. Joaquin like, right, right, right. literally can't turn his lights on at night because it messes with the bird's natural habitat. So we're talking about in the middle of nowhere, Absolutely in the middle rustic of winemaking. Yeah. He doesn't and live And you said out there, something about him being like a one-man show. He is a one-man show. So he does all the viticulture, like the winemaking, the all of it it's like literally like the craziest hobby you can possibly think of but and what drew him to wine? well he's a geologist and so what drew him out here is the fact that it's one of the places in the world that has this really crazy contrast of um ancient soil types and something that like you really can't grow grapes in. Right. when we were there he took us to this place that was like literally like you, could, you stood in the middle of the road and this side was all black and this side was all white. And this is this big rocky outcrop. Right. And so basically you can grow grapes on that side, but not on this side. Duro, not duro. Right. Grapes can't grow in this, too dense. Grapes can go through this porous uh, soil. So what we are talking about today are four wines. Bananas. From... <laughs> Sorry. I was going to say banane, but uh, <laughs> these are four wines that come from uh, one of the hottest, driest, craziest places, like I said, that wine is grown in. The fact that you can make white wine here is pretty crazy, but this it is... It has to be pretty hard to cultivate white wines in this area. Well, over, I mean, red, thick reds, I understand, but white wines... It's almost... It almost doesn't matter because at the end of the day, grapes, just like people, they have to do certain things to protect themselves from you know, heat exhaustion or heat stroke. So this is why we have leaves and canopy. Um, at the end of the day, these grapes only can ripen for about three, four hours during the daytime because right. grapes naturally shut down when it gets to 90 degrees. So the fact that they grow white grow grapes here is actually not And it gets crazy. cold at night. It goes, to, it goes from 118 to 59 yeah. every single day. It's completely bananas, yeah. like you said. So let's <laughs> taste this wine. Uh, the first thing that we are tasting is a white wine that um, a lot of times People, when they say Portuguese white wine, people have no idea what that means. What I always say about this wine is like, think about if you've ever had the grape Albarino, think about this as Albarino, just with more. It has more body and it has more, a little bit more texture. It doesn't have that same quality, salty kind of quality, but it still goes with the same things that Albarino tends to go with. Think shellfish. Yeah, think. anything salty, little richness, oysters, and, uh, how about, how about like, uni? oh fuck, <laughs> oh now you're talking, uh, there's a Santa Barbara kind of influence. Uh, I also think that this wine is uh, perfect as just a standalone, let us not overthink this, this is a great white wine, white wine. Yeah. Um, and also it's like, come on, this is the thing that you want to be able to pop open on a Monday night and not feel guilty about, because A, it's not expensive. I was going to say, the price is... Pretty, it's pretty great. Yeah. But also, it's not something that you necessarily have to overthink. And when we're talking about grape varieties here, and thank you so much, um, a lot of times people put emphasis on grape varieties and like, what does this taste like? Like, what is this supposed to be similar to? Portugal, for a really long time, has gotten away with um, uh, like not worrying about it because Nobody people didn't pay attention to it. <laughs> but now that people are paying attention to it, I think one of the things that it is on us to explain to people is that, look, not everything needs to fit into a box. Our memory, our like, just like, basically the way that we think about things necessitates us to th say, this is like this, this is like this, this is like this. I was gonna say, we tend to categorize everything. So let's like, just categorize these things in the way that like naturally flows into it. Kind of like 
Albarino, Sauvignon Blanc, kind of like in those, that right. kind of a category. Rich All enough three, for Chardonnay, but... Yeah, I wouldn't say this is the Chardonnay drinker's wine. I would say these three are Cabernet drinker's wines. For sure. Because these are big, juicy, full-bodied red wines. Like, you know, we talked about last month about like that red wine not being a Cabernet Slab wine. This is a Cabernet yeah. Slab wine. Like, this is big. Well, and now we get to taste uh, different vintages. Yeah. Which is something we haven't done. Well, this past. is also kind of fun because you mentioned vintages. And so we're talking we're talking about 2017. Yeah. And I had people ask me, is like, is this like our library release? Like, no. This it's current is, release. It's current release. Yeah. All three of these wines are current release. Right. And sometimes it takes a one-man show in a place that nobody else wants to make wine in. Yeah. Something that's incredibly with difficult. With land prices. With started. land prices being exactly why yeah. Joaquin went all the way out there to actually do the project. Uh, to be able to bring us something that has um, a, a... Authenticity. Authenticity. And also just like, it's ready to go. Like, if you were to drink this version because of this like, wine... Because, like, Napa Cabernet can't afford to hold things back until they're ready to be drunk. And that's why Napa Cabernet is made in some certain ways. Right. Made to be drunk right. younger. Just like the component that we had um, a couple of months ago. That wine is from 2019, but it was made to be enjoyed in this time frame. This is a little bit different. You know, like, you know, the, he does, Joaquin doesn't have well, Marc Gagnon to delicious. be able to do that. This is like literally, this is what the Dura produces. It's juicy, but oh my God, there's some acid there. Mm -hmm. And, and so, tannin. And flavor and depth. Yeah. This is a big one. So you're talking about backyard barbecue kind of like uh, things. You're talking about brisket. Right. You're talking about burgers. You're talking know, about like. I'm thinking duck. I don't know why. Because you're, you know, here in the inner <laughs> Richmond. <laughs> but uh, the. Uh, idea behind this wine is it is incredibly versatile to drink on its own, but yes, it does have this like really kind of like a richer, fattier food. So we had like, a, a little bit of a talk yeah. uh, about flagship wines, mm -hmm. and um, and you said this is the, his flagship wine. Yeah. Okay. And so meaning that that's like his this style is, that he wants to hang his hat on, right? Um, this is the wine that every single year he produces and releases, and this is his kind of like blockbuster. If I was going to bring one wine to a tasting, this, this would is be what it he wants because to bring. I make it every year. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, the other two wines that we're yes. going to taste are fundamentally different. And this is like one of the cool things that we are uh, lucky enough to be able to bring to the Bliss Wine Concierge, the, the club aspect of it, is because we don't just send you the average like kind of flagship thing and just kind of leave it at that. We dug deep into Joaquim's cellar here and we brought you two wines that are fundamentally something that you normally don't taste out of a wine club. We brought you things that are very limited production and that are only really released to us because <laughs> um, we be friends. Uh, <laughs> but uh, think of this next wine, the Pioche Argilish. Um, yeah. as um, the essentially the same wine that this bottle um, uh, has, except for this is grown on clay. Right. Arzilla's okay. Okay. is clay. Like, right? Oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, that's, well, like, that's all it means. Portuguese. They're very yeah. literal, you know? It's like, like the next one is called Ashtarigas. Well, that means the Tarigas. What do you think it's made from? Okay. Two Tarigas. Uh, so the idea was the- Nacional and Franca? <laughs> Some. Um, so the idea here is that this wine is from 2013. This is the current release, um, and he didn't make a ton so of this. So 10 years old current release. Yes. The reason why is that he doesn't want to release wines but until they're actually ready to drink. I think that's fantastic. This like, is ready fantastic. to drink. This is ready to drink. This yeah. is ready to drink. But for different reasons, this wine is made in a kind of like a little bit of a different way. Um, so. Think of this as being grown on colder, denser mm -hmm. soil than this. So you're talking about inhospitable here. You, now can, try you can actually taste it. There's yeah. a little it bit just, less like complete fruit forward. There's a little bit more um, salty character. Uh, it kind of has, it has that, that terracotta kind of like, like yeah, red, exactly. kind of like, um, bricky flavor, uh, flavor to it. But so whereas this is like something that like everybody enjoys and like I always call like this lineup the perfect like family dinner lineup yeah. because if you have somebody just like want something really fruity easy to drink 
something like this. You have your you have that staunch. You have your white wine that's some, find like finds your Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, yep. what have you. You have your big cab. You have your complex maybe Pinot. and then yeah. holy shit. With All right, well. Uh, let's talk about food with this and then move on to the fourth wine. Well, let's talk about food with this because the bigger thing that this, these fruitier wines have is they have this juiciness and this density so it can hold up to richer, fattier stuff. This, I would say drink it with a leaner cut of meat or yep. also switch the flavor profile. Switch to lamb instead of beef Yep. to where the flavor of the meat is more important than the flavor of the fat. Yep. It's half Turiga Nacional, half Turiga Franca, two Portuguese grapes. Essentially, like Turiga Nacional is like the... So I was going to ask you earlier to describe them a little bit. Um, uh, well, we talked about like not categorizing things and putting it in a box. We did. So well, let's go ahead and put things in a box. Um, uh, let's talk about Turiga Nacional as basically being the Cabernet of Portugal. Cabernet Sauvignon, if you like it, and you like it ripe, and you like it juicy, yeah. Portugal is your friend. Because Turiga Nacional has that same blue fruit, black fruit kind of a inter yeah. interaction. It's dense, it's tannic, and, and it's juicy. It, I'm just like connecting dots here, but that's like um, Toro de Toro or Ribera del Duero instead of Rioja. Essentially, like, yeah. Okay, yeah. like so, super ripe, super concentrated, big ass. Big ass. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's a very technical term. It's uh, it's 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 not it's not you driving uh, you know cross country with an SUV with a little U-Haul uh, trailer behind it. It's the whole goddamn fucking U-Haul, and it is uh, a, a grape that and a wine style that I think is perfect for people that really like California wine, except for it has this uh, capacity. If you let it age, I was going to say. So we've, we, I mean, we've got what's the two thousand fifteen years? Yeah, this yeah. is this is the current release. This is the you don't the next which time. is kind of uh, honestly, I want to like impress that. Like it's it's kind of amazing that a winery can hold it back for that many years until they think it's the way the, that it's drinking the way they really want it to drink. The whole point of this wine, why Joaquim actually made it. And he actually made it as like an experimental batch and yeah. because it did well. He's trying to make it again. Uh, but essentially this is the place in the world that gives us port. And uh, port is a wine made from red grapes from this is the same place. But what they do is they make the wine and then they fortify it and then they age it for a really long time in barrel or in tank. And then they put it in the bottle. So what this wine did was it aged for two years in a barrel and then he bottled it and he aged for eight more in years before anybody else got a chance to taste it. Yeah. So this wine was released in 2016, but he didn't feel like super comfortable like with just being like, hey, by the way, I made this. So he kind of kept it under wraps. So one of the few places in the world where you can actually taste uh, this uh, wine is, is with us because we're literally one of the few people he's ever sold it to. Right. Because he didn't believe, because the Portuguese wine market is basically still like you know fairly young they buy a lot of shit like this right they buy less shit like that they almost don't buy anything like that this is like a tadonia sort of style D doesn't it remind you of it you very know? much so yeah and it, for, to me it has like that same flavor profile that like young unico has yeah and except for like you know the one Fourteenth of the price, but it has like that precisely really actually dense <laughs> <laughs> some shit. Um, I think it pairs really well with um, the same things that this thing pairs with, with leaner cuts of meat and sometimes hamburger helper. <laughs> I was gonna say bolognese pasta. You took it right out of my mouth. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Uh, the uh, thing about these wines is like again, intensity is everything. This is big, dense, and juicy. It needs a lot. These wines are a little bit more subtle. It needs a little bit less. So think about whatever you're cooking. Are you putting a lot of effort into the intensity of flavor? If you are, go here. If you're not, go there. But the wines are just delicious no matter what you do with them.